that's nice. It's like a little friendly group of us who are going to get to hang out right now. How is, um, how is everybody doing? It's the end of a long week. It's good to hear. Thank you for being here and not either at the Experimental Gameplay Workshop or face down in a bucket of margaritas, which is where I intend to be in, you know, 68 minutes or something. Um, selling my soul. That's why we're here. Um, this is a slightly, slightly different from any talk I've given before. Uh, the nice folk at GDC got in touch earlier in the year and said, would you be interested in giving a talk about what it's been like going from kind of deep art house indie to commercial free to play, which is the change that I've made over the last couple of years. Um, and I thought it sounded great. It's interesting. There's been, you know, I've learned a lot in the course of doing that. It would be fun to share some of those conclusions um, with you guys. But then I realized that really what that talk added up to was something a little bit less palatable because there's no way of, there's certainly no way of talking truthfully about how I got from there to here and what that journey's been like without um, exposing the realities of some of the bumps along the way. So, um, I'm Margaret, and uh, you're about to discover more about my career and my life than you were perhaps bargaining for. So let's, let's start out by kind of giving you your bearings a bit in terms of how that journey stacks up. So I think what was in people's minds um, when they were asking me to do this talk was the time that I spent at Hide and Seek. So Hide and Seek was a experimental um, game studio founded in London. Uh, we branched out and had a New York studio that, that I moved over and ran. Um, and we were kind of best known for, for very hybrid games. So often that meant digital worlds with a, digital games with a real world component or collaborations between digital game makers and artists or choreographers, um, kind of all points in between. So here's a super quick survey of some of our projects that people may have heard of. Um, Board Game Remix Kit was an, an early independent project that we did um, that we designed um, in the middle of having a depressing conversation about how much we were all dreading going home for Christmas, because when you go home at Christmas, somebody pulls out that mostly broken, awful board game from the top of a cabinet, and you all have to play Monopoly or Trivial Pursuits with the cards that are 25 years out of date, so nobody knows any of the answers anymore. So the Board Game Remix Kit was a physical card set and um, a smartphone app that uh, kind of mashed up and remixed a bunch of games that you are likely to have, Monopoly, Clue, Trivial Pursuit, Scrabble, uh, and gave you new rule sets or, or new um, kind of combined ways of playing them, some super, super nice stuff in there. That was fun. We made a, uh, an iPhone game called The Show Must Go On, which is the world's first opera platformer. Um, this was in collaboration with the Royal Opera House, cast you as a um, put-upon stage manager who was trying to get the uh, show up and running, uh, but uh, was in the course of finding out that everything had gone wrong. The, the costumes had got messed up, the set hadn't been built, the sheet music for the orchestra had blown away. And you would play a bunch of kind of one step above WarioWare little puzzle games to solve those problems. And then at the end of it, you would watch the performance that uh, happened as a result of your preparations. If you played well, then you got a little nice animation where everything went great. If you messed up, then you got a little dynamically generated animation wh where things went wrong depending on which games you had failed in. So if you found all the sheet music, then you got a gorgeous orchestral recording uh, of the real Royal Opera House Orchestra playing the score. If you didn't, you got a terrible, janky chiptune version that we made. The stunts go wrong, the costumes change around. Cute, fun, nice thing. Uh, this is New York Games, which was a city-wide game that we ran on New Year's Eve in Edinburgh a few years ago. Uh, New Year's Eve is a massive celebration in Edinburgh, uh, and they wanted to follow it up with another huge uh, public uh, event the next day, and so we ran a series of distributed games across the whole city, where you could play and collect tokens. We put you in a team, and you were uh, trying to win the, whichever team won, that team earned the right to set the, give a blessing to the city for the rest of the year, give a tone for the city for the rest of the year, so that, national poet of Scotland wrote two blessings, one for each of the two teams, and then depending on which one won, that was going to set the tone for the rest of the year. So you collect tokens and did things and danced in the streets and wore ribbons. Uh, and then the hub of the game was this huge central square underneath Edinburgh Castle, where we would play mass, mass, mass multiplayer 
uh, real world games. So that culminated in a, in a 5,000 player game of basketball in which nobody was hospitalized. So that's a game design claim to fame. This is Tiny Games, which some people uh, might just remember we kickstarted it a few years ago. This was born out of a series of giant vinyl stickers that we stuck on uh, sidewalks all over London that kind of gave you in a sentence a game that you could play using the surroundings immediately around you. Um, they were a surprisingly big hit out on the street, so we decided to make them digital. And then this was just a very simple system where you, you tell the game where you are, what kind of mood you're in, how many people are there, if you've got a particular prop that might help, and then the engine serves you the perfect little game that you could play there and then. Um, most of these are no longer currently available, which is a thing we can talk about later. Um, but even before and after that, I was doing a bunch of crazy stuff. I don't want to... If anyone's interested in any of these, I can tell you more after. I don't want to bog us down too much in these. But before I was at Hide and Seek, uh, I was on the team behind Papa Sangre, which was a iPhone 3D dungeon explorer survival game, except with no visuals. So you had a completely black screen, and everything about the world was presented via um, binaural 3D audio. So you were navigating by sound alone, which is an experiment that started out as a question about whether or not we could make a horror game that was as uh, accessible to non-sighted players as sighted players. Um, and Drunk Dungeons, a thing I made after I came to New York, which is a game built out of drinks coasters. It's designed for a whole party to play together. Uh, you get put into a team when you arrive, and then every time you get a drink, you get a coaster with the drink, and the coaster is a play piece that either helps you build out the dungeon that the game is happening in, or lets you fight battles or, or move pieces around. And you have to kind of find the right way to coordinate with every other drunk person uh, in the bar to figure out uh, how to make that work. So that, I did that for a long time. And I'm going to retro at a company called Dots. Uh, we're in New York. Um, there is about 50 of us. One of those is me, but you don't win a prize for figuring out which. Maybe you do. Harder than it looks. Um, you should check us out. We're on the internet with that improbably short uh, URL. Uh, we're also on the socials, if you're a fan of the socials. Um, our Instagram is particularly pretty. I recommend my inst your Instagram to you. Um, and we're called Dots because our first game was this game. This game is called Dots. Uh, it was about connecting dots. This kind of came out of a, um, uh, a kind of uh, incubator, skunk worksy thing at a, at a tech startup in New York. Uh, to everyone's surprise, it was a pretty colossal hit. Uh, got a, a lot of attention and a lot of players. Um, and so we followed it up with this game, which was called Two Dots, uh, which is exactly the same mechanic, but kind of expanded out a little bit uh, bigger um, Library of game mechanics uh, got into it and much more configured to be a profitable free-to-play game. Uh, and then last year we released this game, which is called Dots & Co, because I wasn't, I couldn't go with three dots, couldn't do it. Because where do you go next? You can't do four dots. You've got you to gotta call time on it somewhere. So we call time on it. Uh, and this is what we make. Um, and we're lucky that they're popular. Um, and that means we make enough money to have 50 people in New York making them. Um, but it's obviously pretty different from where I was spending my time before then. So I thought I'd like pick up on a couple of key areas um, and just poke at that question of what is, what is different between doing that thing in, a, in an indie or a house environment versus a highly commercialized environment. So speaking of highly commercialized, let's start with the money. Um, and I do start with the money. This is the first thing I look at every day. Uh, these are our, this is our company-wide KPI email that comes out every day. Don't get excited. I've deleted all of the interesting numbers. Not sharing anything that I shouldn't get me into trouble. That I shouldn't be sharing at DDC. Um, but it's true. Every day you get up and you look at where those numbers are sitting. Every single design choice that I make, I'm getting feedback on in, in terms of the metrics that, that our analytics team feedback to me. Um, I'm very conscious of every, every decision that I make, um, kind of from a production perspective, an artistic pr perspective, a game design perspective, has specific ram uh, financial ramifications. Um, and that feels a lot like it comes with the territory, with being not just in a commercial company, but a commercial company where you're kind of, you're getting minute to minute feedback on whether or not the, the, the thing you're doing is hitting the financial targets that you hope that it will hit. Except, this is a thing called the COD. Um, 
I can't remember why it's called the COD. No one can remember why it's called the COD. But it was a thing we used at Hide and Seek to um, track all of our spending and all of our income. This is it. This is, I, haven't, I haven't hidden any of the numbers here because there's no exciting numbers to hide. Uh, but you'll see at the top there's some nicely dynamically formatted cells uh, that go pink, uh, in this case on the 18th of March. Um, and they go pink because that's our go bust date, uh, as some people would call it. We tend to call it our go bust date. Um, because that's really what it was. We were, we were a bootstrapped company. We had no resources. Um, we could only pay ourselves the next month if we got paid the previous month. And a, especially for the, for the, the people you know, who were kind of mostly concerned with running the company, if whom I was one, it dominated your waking hour to an extent that I could never really articulate at the time um, because you knew that you couldn't pay rent next month if this didn't happen, but also that a bunch of people who you adored, who you had lured away from possibly perfectly successful, sensible person jobs to come and work with you wouldn't get paid. Um, and that pressure was super intense. And so that pressure was a waking up at two in the morning intense pressure, not just a rolling out of bed and checking my KPIs. Um, so the amount of time I spend thinking about money now that I work for a free-to-play company is much reduced. And certainly the amount of kind of energy and friction that I'm dealing with in terms of money um, is radically reduced. It's much nicer. Um, but you, um, you saw those screenshots at the beginning. It seems like a fair question to ask whether or not that has come at the expense of abandoning interesting, unpredictable work for, I mean, I don't want to say boring, but you can see how similar those three screenshots are to each other, right? That's this is the same game three times, and that's what I do. Um, and what I found is a thing I wasn't expecting to find. So this is, these are, don't worry, they don't make sense. Uh, these are early prototypes for the last new puzzle mechanic we introduced in Two Dots. They're called paddles. Um, the kind of idea here is that if you clear dots along, so there are, there are a set of tiles that, that function together. Along one side is a hinge. If you clear dots along the hinge, then they flip, and then whatever they land on, they squish. Um, and then if you clear dots on the other side of the hinge, then they flip back. And while they're not flipping, they act like gaps and dots can fall through them. Um, it's a relatively simple idea, but dots is, two dots is three years old nearly. We're, we're coming up on our third anniversary in May. And that means there's a huge amount of stuff in the game already. This is level 1000, which we just released. And this has every mechanic in the game so far. So you make those two connections that are the only two connections you can make which then drops the cloud, which triggers the cloud, which lets the lotuses trigger, which hits the gems. The gems explode, they hit the bombs, the bomb goes off, that hits the slime, the train triggers, that connects the magnets, the magnets trigger, and that explodes the, oh, um, the monster dot fell, then the thing went, and now the paddle is gonna trigger. Um, and that was your first move in that level. Um, I've, n I've never got to play with something so intricate in my life. Um, the interactions between all these different mechanics um, are currently endlessly interesting. The joy of like getting to drop a new one into that every month or two and see what it changes and what it enables and how it in inflects the flavor of the game is incredibly satisfying. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I, I, a hesitation that I had when I took the decision to join the company was how am I going to feel like, it's literally spots before your eyes, right? There's a point where, can you really look at this all day, every day for, you know, however long? Well, I've been doing it for two and a half years, and I'm nowhere near done with um, enjoying looking at this particular set of things. And that's partly because at Hide and Seek, this was, this was us, this was our logo. This was our tagline. This is what we did. We invented new kinds of play. There's a number of problems with that even as a claim. Um, it's also just so dumb. It's such a bad purgatorial way of being a game designer. You, we were iterate, well, iterating is even the word. We were ideating 
so many new projects in so many crazy configurations where every single thing was on the table. Of, oh, no, we're going to do this with motion sensors. No, we're not. We're going to do it with like uh, super weird targeted speakers that know where you are. No, we're not. We're going to do it with um, a partnership with Nike. No, we're not. We're going to do it with whatever. Everything was possible. And you, you s very rapidly stop being a good, or you risk stopping being a good game designer and, and, and just being a good game describer. That, that becomes your job, that you just show up in a room and you say a bunch of stuff that sounds good about a thing that doesn't exist. Um, and then maybe you get to make it, but if you do get to make it, you're going to spend three months making it and you're not going to have time to get it right. But it doesn't really matter because everybody's going to be on to the next thing three weeks after that. Um, and it's invigorating. And there are, I think, serious merits to going through that process. But it certainly put me in a position where I now could not be happier to have this really, really precisely defined puzzle box that I, that I have this, you know, I, f I, feel, I feel like a jeweler trying to perfect a gemstone rather than somebody trying to whatever it was we were trying to do that whole time. Um, but I thought for sure I was leaving art behind. So I still feel a bit weird about this, but hide and seek was a fundamentally conceived of as an art studio, as an arts institution. We were artists in residence at the South Bank Centre in London, which is one of, if not the biggest arts centres in London. We made work like this. I did a talk about this at GDC a while ago, so I won't take you through it because you can vault it if you care. Um, but this was a, a piece that we made as a counterpoint to a documentary film about the, uh, a very distressing story of uh, the discovery uh, in a London apartment of a, the body of a 36-year-old woman who had lain undiscovered for three years. Uh, and a woman called Carol Morley made a searing emotional, amazing documentary about it, and we got asked to make a partner piece so that people could kind of extend and explore the the, the, the issues and the story that the film told online. Uh, making it was hard and beautiful and weird, and I've never seen anything like it, and I don't know if we got it right, but it was, you know, it, it, it definitely I mean, felt like being an artist, even if I don't know if I wanted to call myself an artist. Um, and that was, that was a huge amount of how we thought about ourselves and what we thought we did. Um, a year later, this company came to us. They're called Capgemini. I don't know what they do, but apparently it's consulting technology and outsourcing. Um, they wanted, I think, to make a mobile web thing that would in tell their clients or convince their clients that buying smart mobile devices for their clients' employees would overall up company productivity more than the devices would cost. And we said, we've got just the thing. And so we took the game that had been that beautiful documentary piece, um, and we stuck a bunch of... Um, I stock photos in it. This is, I draw your attention to the fact this photo is literally called Adult People Having a Business Lunch. Um, and then with Cap Devonow's help, we wrote a lot of um, choose your own adventure business productivity dialogue. I suggest you don't read all of this because it's too gruesome, but there's, there's some highlights that you might want to dwell on. Um, and that was a project for us because it pushed that go bus date a couple months down the road. Um, it was a thing we could do. It felt good to be building on the technology that we'd already developed. Um, but it's a really stark contrast to the, the stuff that we wanted to do and the stuff that we cared about doing. And because I'm lucky enough to be at a game studio that's um, founded by a bunch of people who care about culture beyond the culture of games, it hasn't necessarily meant leaving this behind. So this is, this is um, contemporary magic. This is a side project that Dots put out last year, uh, a collaboration um, with a, a woman called Stacey Engman who had put together a collection of commissioned interpretations of tarot cards uh, from artists around the world that she wanted to, so she had the cards, but she wanted to make a digital version of the cards, uh, and she was looking for a good partner to do it. And for us, we're at the scale 
that that's not a scary decision to say, well, this is a, this is a pretty simple little standalone thing that we can put together. Um, and so, although I have in theory left all of this behind, to my surprise, uh, it's amazing how much of it you can take with you if you're um, in an environment with the right kind of people, which we'll also talk about more. Um, similar thing. This has really surprised me, and I feel a bit torn about it. Part of why I wanted to work with Hide and Seek, why I wanted to stay at Hide and Seek, was I can't remember. Did I know? Are either Alex or Holly here? I don't think they made it. There's other very good hide and seek people here uh, this week. Um, you, if you find them, you should talk to them because uh, it'll be fun. Um, this was a, a thing I was super proud of. Well, stay with me. This was the ARG we made for the launch of the Green Lantern movie uh, starring Ryan Reynolds, which none of you saw. It's terrible. Right. It's terrible. Um, but they wanted an ARG, and that's the kind of thing we did. So we felt we could have some fun with it. And part of how we had fun with it was uh, with this project. Um, I knew some folks at Cambridge University who were trying to run some citizen science digital tools to deal with a weird problem that now apparently exists in astronomy, which is we have really good photographic resources of space now. Um, this picture that you're looking at here is from the Spitzer Space Telescope. Um, so we have this huge amount of raw material of images of space, but computers are still pretty bad at um, doing visual analysis or photographs. They were certainly even worse whenever this was six or seven years ago that we were doing it. So what actually ends up happening is that grad students are just expected to invest hours of extra time in manually going through all of these photos to see if they can see anything that looks interesting. And this project was specifically about trying to find um, photographic evidence of the birth of new stars. Um, and what happens when, I'm, like if anybody who actually understands any of this stuff is here, just do this for now, because I'm, I'm on shaky ground here, but for the sake of the talk. What happens when a star is born is there's a huge explosion. All the stuff, sorry, all the stuff, uh, not that there's much space stuff, but there's some space stuff that was around the star when it explodes gets pushed out. Um, and you end up with a globe of stuff which to a 2D camera looks like a ring. And then it's hard to see because the, colors don't, the pictures don't have any color in them, so then you tint them the way this one is tinted to make it look spacey and cool. And what you get, what you get is a green ring in space for the Green Lantern movie. Um, I was pretty pleased. Um, so we had this cute thing that if you play the ARG, uh, it would it would take you through. We reskinned their citizen science tool to be within the game fiction. Um, then you do a bunch of stuff. You would maybe find a star that no one had ever found before, and then you got a certificate from NASA at the end saying thank you for being a scientist. Uh, and that seemed as was like high on the job satisfaction score, right? That seems like a really nice thing to put together. Um, but the truth is, it's 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 utterly eclipsed by a thing that I had a much smaller hand in, which is that when the travel ban hit a few weeks ago, um, led by former PR CEO, but with just enough of support of a, a ton of people in the company who were on Slack over the weekend, we put an announcement in all our games, um, kind of stating our opposition to anything that was limiting free and fair immigration and directing people to the ACLU donation page. Um, and that pushed half a million um, visitors through from us to the ACLU. Can't then track the onward donation because the technology wasn't in place, but it was there. Thank you. Um, we got a bunch of unbelievably nice letters. Uh, we got a bunch of mean letters, and in the interest of um, balance, I was going to also put those on screen, but the truth is they are so ugly and hate-filled and racist that... I'm not willing to give them the oxygen, so you're just going to get the nice ones. <laughs> These are the nice ones. But it was a real, you know, we, we, as a commercial company, we had to stop and think about what we might be looking at in terms of the repercussions, and we were able to do that and determine that, that it was worth doing. And there is a kind of numbers game reality that 
that hide and seek had had a huge amount of freedom, um, but we just had this really tiny reach. Even when we were trying to surf, you know, we we're trying to find cool ways to, to hitch the ideas that we wanted to do up to a major movie release. And now being at a, a studio that has hundreds of millions of insoles, when we want to have this kind of impact, we we have a capability to do it that we wouldn't otherwise have. Um, and some of that is just to do with this kind of weird, simple bit of math I didn't do until fairly recently. Um, there's, lots of, there's lots of things about working for a commercial free-to-play company that only really makes one kind of game that doesn't seem very exciting or enlivening. But the, what is true is I'm now in a place where all everyone in that room cares about all day, every day, is games. And all the people who are our customers want from us all day, every day, is games. I just I live in this delicious game bubble. And my old job, I got to do a bunch of cool stuff, but it was nearly always in collaboration with somebody else. And those organizations were full of wonderful people, and they were doing great and interesting things. But they mostly cared about chocolate or opera or prescription prices. And they didn't. They didn't even not like games as much. They didn't, they just, they didn't, games didn't, they didn't know about them. They didn't believe in them. They didn't know how to interfa interface with them. They didn't know how to um, write um, contracts for them. They just, they just, it, it, you know, there was just a real boundary there that was hard to cross. And I spent so much more of my time defending and explaining and, and um, lobbying for games than I ever spent actively making them, whereas when I walk in now to my office every morning, I, I, I'm not, there's no friction. I'm just walking with a bunch of other people who want to do game stuff. I should say in all of this, I'm, I'm painfully aware that there are lots of different ways to be a commercial free-to-play company, lots of different ways to be an indie, and, and I know indies who don't do anything like this. Um, so please don't think that I'm, I'm suggesting this is the only way around it is, but this is, this is the bit of it that I know about, so I thought it made sense to start there. Um, it's rainbow. Because here's the thing, maybe this whole premise, this whole question about the transition from indie to commercial is just a big pile of rainbow poop. Maybe it's not really a meaningful um, transition at all because I think what I found, and I, and I spoke to a few people who've, who've been through similar changes before coming into this today, they're kind of saying the same thing. What doesn't change is the work is the work. Um, if you make games for a living, what you're up against in terms of all of the weird, technical, psychological, artistic, commercial challenges that you face, of like starting with nothing and trying to get to a thing four weeks, four months, four years later, that people will understand and know how to use and stick with and derive a sense of accomplishment from and doesn't fall over all the time, whatever else might go wrong with it. It just doesn't change. This is, the, this is an awesome um, collection of Richard Serra uh, ink drawings um, from an exhibition called Work Comes Out of Work. And I, I, that phrase gets stuck in my head a lot, even though it's a bit hard to explain because it feels like what it means to me is that the... You know, you think of work in terms of an artwork, the work is like this finished object that you see in a gallery. But the way you get to that thing is, is through the work, is through the daily, boring, stupid, trudgy work that you do. And you can't get there without here. And in fact, you can't directly make that. You just need to do this stuff and you do enough of it for long enough and then the thing emerges at the end of it. And that just feels the same. I mean, the truth is, I probably burst into tears a little less often, but working on a new mechanic for dots doesn't feel fundamentally different from working on a game about death. I still have a bunch of like logic flows I can't resolve, and I need a bigger piece of paper because I always need a bigger, pa bigger piece of paper, and then I sit there for three hours until I figure it out, and then I figure it out, and then I go and talk to an engineer, and then the next day we play it, and then hopefully it's better. That's just the same. It just doesn't change. So for all that it looks like, I've been through this kind of massive um, like career U-turn. It, it, in practice, doesn't feel like it at all. But I think there are some things that came out of being in that crazy 
in the environment that I brought into commercial free-to-play that I wouldn't have come any other way. Um, this is one of them. Um, this is a crying child. Um, my work used to involve a lot more crying children. Um, when you make real-world games, physical world games, really often, especially when you're, you're developing them, when they're, they're um, still being designed, your players and your playtesters are they're like they're in the room with you, but they are so in the room with you. You probably, you, 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 you're, there's no like mediated thing where you give them a screen and you get to sit back. You're probably going to say stuff. You, if you're me, you're standing on a chair because you're five foot two and no one can see you. You're going to tell a bunch of people to do things, and they are trusting you that it, doing them is going to be fun. And they do them, and it stinks because the game is still in development. And then they come back and they yell at you, and that is what making games is like. And that's bad enough. What's worse is when they're three years old. Um, we did a, the, the Tiny Games project I mentioned earlier, we, we followed up with a collaboration with Sesame Street, which was a, a, an amazing, delightful experience. Um, but we did a bunch of similar Tiny Games for sort of three and four-year-olds and their parents were caregivers. And you have to play test those things and, and, and not wreak psychological catastrophe on the children who are play testing them in the, in, the, in the course of doing that. Not always easy. And it turns out that one three-year-old is better at cup stacking than her four-year-old sister, and the four-year-old isn't okay with that, and a whole thing happens. Um, and so I think the, the, the intimacy and the immediacy of the playtesting experience that I had in an experimental real-world play focused studio taught me things that I never would have learned working in a, uh, just in a digital studio and just in a, in a casual digital studio. Um, the, the, I talked earlier about the downside of the inventing new kinds of play thing where you're, you never get to the bottom of an idea. Um, but there's a pretty big upside. This, I, I can only show you this for half a second because there's proprietary stuff on it. That, gone, that was, was pulled out of a real email, a team email. We do a team email each week at Hide and Seek of all the things we were working on. Um, that just listed out all of our projects, and that was one from a few months before we, we took the decision to close. Um, this is a kind of translation of what we were doing. So on the left is the stuff that, that was live that was actively in production or release. So the Sesame Street thing I just showed you, the tiny games we just talked about, we were making prototypes with Leap Motion for in-house for an in-house project that we wanted to do. We were installing seven-foot playable carrots at the Royal Botanic Gardens in London. We had a thing going with the government policy research unit that I can't remember much about. Those plastic, those vinyl stickers were going down somewhere. We were doing a movie marketing thing that wasn't Green Lantern. Holly, if she was here, was writing a twine game about philosophy for the Open University. That terrible Cap Gemini device thing was happening. We were making a uh, iPhone, an iPad app for, for young learners of the violin that would listen to them play and then tell them what to do to correct in this kind of music course that we were putting together for them. And we had a large installation at Kensington Palace uh, where you played a bunch of games. It was a very, very, very astonishing kind of medieval museum in London. We had games installed throughout the palace and you played things and you collected things. And then when you got to the end, it was for Christmas kind of aimed at kids and their families. When you got to the end, if you'd played well enough, you became king or queen, you got to choose your royal name, you built a big placard for yourself that had your name on it, and then we had a smart throne. When you sat on the throne, it could feel that you sat down, and it read your board, because your board was full of RFIDs, and then it played a fanfare, a dynamically generated fanfare that was just for you and your name, so that your dad could take a photo of you. It's kind of nice. So that was live that week. That was the stuff we were doing live that week. And then the stuff that we were pitching on that week was um, a therapy app with a major dementia charity who was interested in whether or not um, occupational therapy could be extended to digital play therapy. It was in the middle of like the gamification of money stuff. So we had an investment management company who thought we could help them. We had a pension company who thought we could help them. A thing was happening that I can't remember about. Some guys who, a big slot machine company, thought maybe that there should be an experiential real world game that sat around the slot machine experience, so we were trying to help them with that. The UK government wanted a bunch of people to go to a tourist destination that nobody was going to, and they thought an ARG could help. Um, there was a lightly pornographic movie, I'll leave it up to you to guess which one it was, that wanted a text adventure. I still think, I 
did some of my best game design for, but different question. There was a stupendously enormous movie deal that I still can't talk about, but... Oh! Uh, we were taking Tiny Games from Decade, which was a long way away. Uh, one of the companies that did the... Uh, you know, when you go to a museum, you can like hire a digital guide that tells you a bunch of stuff about where you are. Uh, the people who make those were interested in doing Tiny Games for one of those. A mall wanted a three-story playable sculpture thing that was kind of half a helter-skelter and half an escape the room that we would charge people money to go into. There was another movie that wanted a thing. There was another government thing that wanted a thing. And a major Hollywood visual effects studio was wondering if they should stop just making visual effects for movies and start making games of their own. So we were in development with a major new project for that. Um, six people worked at the London office. And every week was like that. And you get really good at having ideas fast in that environment. Because we needed to chase all of those things because only every 30th would turn into a thing because most of them, as you can see, are bonkers and should never have happened. Um, and so the fluidity and the, 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 the fastness of feet that you need to develop to kind of survive that stuff is really profound. And you also need to get really, really good at, oh, hang on, I skipped a slide. Um, social is another thing that you design for differently when you're in that environment. If you live only in the digital social world, I think you tend to have these kind of creepy, um, uh, kind of virology uh, analogies for social spread. I know we don't talk about K-Factor anymore, but there is this kind of like creepy um, sense that things spread without any kind of real autonomy, that this isn't about any of the particular individuals. It's just if you package it right and you incentivize it correctly, then you can count on a certain percentage of people to press the button and a certain percentage of the people that, that button goes to to press the button. If you're designing physical space social games, you have a much, much clearer understanding that the, 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 the unit of social interaction is, is one to one and one to one between two individuals with their own dynamic and um, preferences and priorities. So this was um, probably the most successful social feature that I designed and one that I think I never would have designed if I hadn't come out of that feature. This was um, a crazy text adventure we did for Skyfall, the Bond movie, um, with, a with a natural language chatbot. So the hook was that you were, you were going through your initial test to find out whether or not you could be a good MI6 agent. Um, so you got hooked up to the system that was, uh, the conceit, I guess, was kind of that MI6 agents have like codecs that they type into when they're having a bad day. The would fly. And so you hook in and they're like, oh, this has all gone wrong. I don't know what to do. I'm stuck. I'm, help me. And you would type your way through it, figure out how to solve their problem. Uh, and if you want out, you would get an email psychological analysis that told you the, the fake MI6's assessment of, what, of how you played and what kind of person you were. So in this one, I played manipulatively. Um, but then we would tell you that we, you were looking for a different kind of agent. So a ruthless agent or an unpredictable agent or an impetuous agent. Um, and so in this Recruit Friends box, we would ask you um, to nominate somebody. So we'd hook you through to your Facebook friends, but you could only pick one. Um, and it was kind of fun. Like when you get a thing that says, who is your most manipulative friend? And you look through your list of Facebook friends, mm, you can't help but kind of go, oh, no, well, not her, but mm, him. Um, and what we got was through the roof rates for both this share but then also the response rate from the people that we shared it to because they felt like they were getting something meaningful. We also, this was a, a collaboration with Warren and Kennedy and they had a super cute idea uh, that if you tried to circumvent that and share it more widely, it showed up on your Facebook feed as redacted. So you could, you could share the URL, but it, everything showed up with the text blacked out. It looked super cool. Um, so we just, we just said, no, you don't, you have to, one person, pick one person. And it worked so well. And I never would have done it if I hadn't made a bunch of real world social games that, that operate kind of very differently. So that still feels different and better, that's that. And then uh, when I started out working in games and as a game designer, I'd, I, I kinda, I, I'd, I'd come up as a game journalist and a game designer, and if you asked me to express myself, I would write you an essay. I would do a nice design document, with headings, and that's what you would get. And I went from that to being smashed into a room with people from, from Wyden and Kennedy or RGA or Mother or whatever else, or people from Tate Modern or 
Royal Opera House, the expectation of your ability to communicate visually and the expectation of your ability to, to present your ideas um, kind of to the best of their capabilities was a, was a lot of pressure very fast. And I, I, I mean, you guys are um, going to be the judge of it, but um, I'm hoping that I'm a little bit better at presenting my ideas than I was uh, when I started out uh, with those endless Word documents. So, I'm, ob I'm contractually obliged to give you takeaways. I think I might actually be contractually obliged to give you takeaways. That joke doesn't work in America, does it? Have we got any Brits who can give me a takeaway laugh? No, all right. You're lucky you didn't get a picture of a munchie box, which you, sounds like you shouldn't Google, but you can Google, but then you'll still kind of wish you hadn't Googled. Um, so I try to think about, can I, can I give any advice that's actually real useful advice and advice that I can imagine myself having followed either at a, the indie studio when I was helping run that or at the, the commercial studio that I'm helping run now. Um, and I decided that in both cases, it's, it's, uh, it's all about the three Fs. Um, I think the, I'm lucky to be in the studio that I'm, I'm at now and a big part of what's enabled that is just the people that we have. We have a weird mix of people, and we are very unprejudicial about what people's backgrounds are. We don't care about experience, and we don't care about industry background. What we do care about, or certainly what I care about when I'm looking to hire game designers, is, is that kind of fundamental fluency. Are you fast? Are you used to having to undergo a bunch of playtesting? Are you good at taking that kind of feedback? Are you good at communicating your ideas? effectively and visually to a team. I do not care how you've come by that experience. I don't care whether you've got a degree. I don't care whether you've been, I don't care if you do have experience and you're bringing it to me out of a free to play studio. I don't care if it's a bunch of game jams that you've done. I don't care um, if it's some skills that you can transfer across from having been working in advertising or whatever else. I don't care. If I feel like you can do it, that's my number one concern. Um, I do care a bit about your degree of familiarity with the space that I'm in. And free to play has a bunch of weird habits and um, you know, kind of best practices that it's very useful to know, but I don't care um, whether you know them as a player or a designer. Um, if you have some degree of fluency with what uh, that takes, um, or, you know, or how that works and how it fits together, then uh, that's all you need to make it on my list. And then the third F is experience. Um, because it helps, you know, I think that thing that I talked about earlier in terms of knowing what it takes to take something over the line um, does matter. Knowing, you know, th th there is a, an amount of grit and a kind of breadth of focus that you need as you come to the end of a project to make sure that it, it debuts um, fulfilling all of the hopes that you, you had for it. But again, I don't necessarily care about whether that, that not strictly speaking, in games. And I think... Um, the, the value for doing that is there's a, there's, a, there's a different talk I could have been giving today. If I was at a different studio, I wouldn't have been able to say so many of the nice things that I said about, oh, hey, we did this ACOU thing, or hey, we got to do this artist collaboration. I know that not everybody who's working in free-to-play is in that sphere. But in a successful business, there, there just is the scope. I know that from being in an absolutely to the, you know, down to the bones, impoverished indie studio. We never had the scope to do those kind of things. And in a bigger studio, you can if there is the institutional will, and the institutional will is built out of the people who make up the studio. And so the more you bring in people who are gonna help you stay connected to a wider cultural sphere um, and a more diverse set of attitudes and beliefs, the, the more it becomes credible that you can start to kind of incubate those kind of projects and activities within that commercial environment. For Indies, it's also the three Fs. Actually, or three Fs this time. Um, last year I made a sequel. I made Dots & Co, it's a sequel to Two Dots. It was unbelievably hard, so hard. Kind of hated it, learned so much, super proud of it. Um, I never did that as an indie. You never make a sequel as an indie, are you crazy? You're lucky if you survive releasing anything once ever, and then even if you make it that far, you probably have to do something different the next time. And so the, the, the design education I got out of really, really tearing down an existing successful game, it was such a hard challenge because it, 
often when you make a sequel, you made a game and you released it and it did or didn't do okay and then time passed and now you're going to make another version of it. And that's cool. In the modern games and services age, that's not how it works. Two Dots isn't going anywhere. It's wildly successful. It's iterating incredibly fast. Month on month on month, it gets better and cooler and, and grander. Coming in on top of that to say, well, how do I make a sister game that sits next to that meaningfully meant I had to go through a process of kind of like deconstructing all of the stuff about how Two Dots works, but also where it's going, but also where this could go that's different. It was just like no design challenge I'd ever had. So I, I, I exhort um, anybody out there who's working in an in indie or a house space um, to see if they can find a way to make a follow-up. Um, now, I know that's not necessarily simple. I know enough about being an indie to know you don't always get an awful lot of choice about what you do next. If you can't make a follow-up for real, and just pretend. Just do a thought experiment. Just sit down with a thing that you made six months ago. It's a very different process than doing a post-mortem. Go back to a thing that was finished and imagine that you were going to you were going to do a, a sequel to it. You were going to release a new version of it three months, six months, a year from now, and see what it teaches you. Because, um, yeah, because because you may not realize that there's a whole kind of design thinking that you're you're never confronting. Um, if you're working in a way that's more kind of freeform and independent. And then this is, is maybe one of the toughest takeaways for me. I, uh, you know, I loved working independently. I loved the crazy things that I got to do. But I'm seeing now what being at a more fo focused studio is enabling me to do. And I'm, you know, reveling in that opportunity. Um, Alex Fleetwood, who isn't here, uh, my business partner in Hide and Seek, in the time, we, we shut out Hide and Seek Th three years ago, I think, maybe three and a bit. In the time since then, he's caught his breath and then come back with a project that was inspired by a very, very, very embryonic project we did at Hide and Seek maybe six or seven years ago. Um, and he's spent two and a bit years and is now focusing the energy of five or six people at one thing and one thing only, which is this, this is Beast of Balance, um, his new game. Um, he, um, he's been, he showed it at the last two DDCs. He just told me earlier, Today was the first time, well, this GDC was the first time where he came to show the game, instead of having to bring it in a suitcase, when he got to San Francisco, he just went to the store and he bought a copy of it in the store and then brought it to the thing. And it's a great and proud moment. And I look at that and it, it, it looks to me like two things. It looks to me like a thing, a thing we could have made at Hide and Seek. It's so much. You should check it out. It's super cool and crazy and weird. It's so much the kind of thing we love to make there. It's like one part game, one part poem, one part educational app, one part um, sculpture. Um, it's exactly the kind of thing that we love to do. And it's also exactly the kind of thing that we would never have accomplished. Because the way you do this is you do nothing else for two years. Um, and I think when, if I had it all to do again, I think as an indie, we got bounced so much in a, into trying to do everything because we never wanted to turn anything down and we never had the confidence to just try and pick one thing. And I do now really wonder what, you know, there, there were some of those ideas I showed at the beginning were cute ideas. That board game remix kit was a cute idea. Tiny Games was a cute idea. But we put this much focus into it and then had to transfer it to something else. And I think, um, I think if, if I've learned anything m moving into the commercial world actually it's not about it's not about following the money and it's not about worrying about the margins but it's about what um a commercial the, the focus that a commercial con a, a commercial structure can enable um that you that you struggle to get elsewhere um because that's really the thing this i opened with this this is uncle death any uncle death fans yeah. i can't see you but i'm there you go um so this is uncle death he's he's your I don't know what he's, he's your mentor, he's your bully, he's your something or other in Let It Die, um, which is Pseudo-51's weird free-to-play console brawler. Um, and that's interesting because, I mean, I picked him just because he was my favorite Grim Reaper I could find in games. I tried to find good devils in games and it's a weird space. Once so you decide you don't want to do a Diablo thing, you don't know what else you're going to do. Um, his, uh, his scythe's a golf club. Um, but yeah, so I picked him because he's cool. But also, I mean, there is, a, there is somebody who has, you know, whose career has taken him from making 
things that are very much on the margins and very much kind of creatively auteur style defined and delivered through to a point where, you know, I make free-to-play games and he plays, he makes free-to-play games now and they're pretty different and, you know, we, we have nothing to do with each other, but it seemed like an interesting emblem. But, so he's a cute choice of Grim Reaper, but he's not really appropriate because this is more about rebirth, I think. The, we work in a super volatile industry. I don't, there's, there's probably nobody here or functionally nobody here who's been cozy and happy in the same company for the last 25 years making the same kind of games. That's not how it works for us. There's, there's too many winds of change blowing around games. It's part of what we love about games. The technology changes or the business model changes um, or the audience changes uh, or we uncover some kind of new control mechanism or new paradigm. We're all dodging all the VR stuff out there right now. Um, it's never going to let us rest easy. And so for me, the biggest thing I've learned in this transition is those fundamentals, that kind of the work is the work core practice stuff comes with you. Like even if everything else falls apart and we, we hide and seek had an elegant end. We never hit that go bust date, despite the fact it was, <laughs> it was, it tried its best. And we were able to like find the right moment to say, this isn't going to work anymore. And finish our projects, close things down elegantly, treat our, everybody who worked there, I hope, well, we believe that we did that well. Um, still felt god awful. It felt absolutely excruciatingly miserable. And I know that I'm not necessarily safe from that again in the future. Right now I'm at a happy, successful company that all our expectations are, will continue to be happy and successful, but I've done this long enough to know that a you know, there are, there are fates that await game companies. They get bought by less friendly game companies or their fourth sequel doesn't do as well or they back the wrong horse in terms of a technology platform or an input mechanism or whatever it is. So I probably won't be here forever either. But now I, 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 I've got a clearer sense of how translatable the skills that I have are, not necessarily to different industries, but just to different places within the same industry. And I think we'll do better if we recognize that in each other, that, that rather than just ending up with, a, with a, a much more kind of closed circle where indies know how to talk to indies but are skeptical about people who've come from a free-to-play background or vice versa, we recognize that there are fundamental capabilities that transcend those categories. That is what I have for you. Um, we're hiring. That's it. You're done, GDC's over! <laughs> Your uh, questions are welcome. Okay. So um, the topic that was most interesting to me about the transition a lot of what you're describing to me feels like going from like a consulting environment in some ways, because you're also doing projects for these corporate clients, going to free to play. Mm. The, the thing that has struck me like coming to GDC over the last five years was there was a lot of discussion about free to play where you know, it was whales and it's about paywalls and ads and offers and Skinner boxes, frankly, mm -hmm. where it felt very skeevy to me. So for me, like when I'm thinking about free to play, that's the part that creeps me out. To be perfectly honest, is is that um, obviously, um, you know, Dots has a model, right? How how much does that influence your design work? How you feel about what you do when you look at free to play and what you associate with, kind of that. So I, I, I it's sort of a broad question. No, but I, think, I get it. You know what? Um. So, I, what's, Dots is a very classic free-to-play approach, and a thing that makes my life very easy is that we don't, we don't do anything we would be uncomfortable if our players knew about. That's kind of our litmus, is would we, would we feel okay about if someone who loved our game came in and said, how does this work, and we went, oh, well, it's like this, would they, would they feel like we'd been um, tricking them. So there's a couple things that we're not super public about just because they're complicated, but we'd very happily talk anyone through them at length. It's just hard to put it in a tweet in a way that won't misconstrue. There's like a bunch of like super 
dense spawning rules around objects to make sure that the games stay fun even when players do weird things and so it's those are hard to explain but they're not they're designed only to make sure people continue to have happy gaming experiences they're not they're not revenue focused um it, it's weird i've i've made games that are just supposed to be about joy i've made games that are in a consulting or educational environment where you're taking people to a point where there's some kind of threshold you have to cross, um, where they have to learn a thing or do a thing. Sometimes that thing is they have to click on a link to go to the Green Lantern trailer, and sometimes it's have to, they have to prove that they've learned a Greek verb, or sometimes whatever they, they are. And now I'm in this place where I, we have a sumptuous, expensive game that we give away for free, and then we get people to a point where we say, if you want to keep going right now, you need to put your hand in your pocket. And those things just feel super identical to me. Like, it's definitely not harder or weirder to get somebody to give me a dollar than it is to get them to watch the Green Lantern trailer. And it's actually not that different. In fact, maybe quite a lot easier than when I'm designing a street game for Edinburgh where what I'm trying to construct is a, is a, is a set of gaming incentives where you will go and hold the hand of a stranger. And frankly, if you, if you give me the design challenge to to make you give me a dollar versus the one where you have to hold on to the stranger, I'll take the dollar, right? That's, a, that's easier. So I think the, 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 the design challenge doesn't feel any different. It's, it's, it's about motivating your player and then restricting the resources that they have to reach the thing that you've motivated them to reach and then giving them interesting options to resolve that restriction and then spending is one of them, but you're always gonna wanna offer your player that choice anyway, and so it's just what you swap in and out of those categories. That doesn't, it just feels exactly the same. Where it would feel different is if there was stuff that I thought was exploitative or underhanded or designed to, designed to mislead or trick people. Um, we just don't have any of that, so it seems easy. Does, is that at all helpful? Yeah, I, th I think um, if I was gonna try to like replay it, the real core is as long as you're transparent with the users and you're and you feel ethical about what you're producing, it's okay. So, and that might be part of that design process too about like where do you put in your loops and how do you construct them? Are these things feeling ethical or not? If you feel good about it, then, well, you can sleep at night. I mean, yeah, that's kind of what I'm, I think I'm hearing. I don't know. I, I, think, that, I think that's right. And, and I, that, I, that doesn't feel at all controversial to yeah. me. And I, th I think some of it definitely comes from designing face to face with players. The, 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 the model that I always have in my head is that a, a human is going to, an individual human is going to want to sit down and ask me questions about any design choice that I make. Right. And yeah, it, just, it kind of just makes it trivially easy. It's like, do I know how to answer that person's questions? Cool, then I'm doing the right thing. If I'm uncomfortable, then we do something else. It's easy. Yeah. That's helpful because that also will allow me to, one of the things I'm struggling, I'm sorry, you guys oh. have a question, is um, how do I, um, test out my monetization strategy. And so if I can sit with somebody in face-to-face -face and know that they're gonna say, okay, well, no, that's skeevy or that's good, that also gives yeah. me a design. Well, I, I do, I, I, I pen and paper test all my monetization stuff. Well, I pen and money test all my monetization stuff. I have a couple of dollar bills on my desk and, and tokens and everything gets tested like that. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Hi. So there was another talk today. Uh, there's a researcher who is surveying game designers to uh, get their definition of success. Uh, so what's your definition of success and did it change when you moved from, from one studio to the other? You don't have to answer. Um, yeah, I've, I, I have so far been 100% unsuccessful. I would say, I've not, like I'm like I, I feel like I'd maybe be successful if I made a thing that I felt was good and that I was proud of. I don't really feel like that. Everything is everything is full of compromises and missed opportunities. The games that I love have a essentialism about them that you know that you couldn't you can't change a single rule of that game because it's just right. It's just perfect and. I'm fascinated by those games and in all of them, and I know I've not come close to making anything that good. So there's like, I guess, yeah, I guess I have two definitions of success. There's that one which I haven't hit and maybe I'll never hit, 
keep trying. And then the other one is, oh my god, I make games for a living. Any year where I can pull that together is a success. And you know, I've done it for 10, and maybe I'll get to do it for more. And you know, I think kind of as long as I'm within that, that ethical territory, I'm not that fussy about what it is, because it's, a, it's this weird, wonderful, absorbing task that I'm nowhere near tired of yet. Um, I just want to say, really loved your talk and the really personal wandery style you used. Um, I think it's fantastic and very honest, and I appreciate that. Um, now for my question. Um, you've talked a lot about, about, or hinted at your design process, and it seems to be you know, pretty rigorous and rational. But also, I think a lot of people in free-to-play, especially in mobile, feel that there's an element of luck to a game becoming a smash hit. And I would like your thoughts on that. Do you believe, for example, Dots was mostly genius with a bit of luck? Do you feel like it was a lot of luck with a bit of genius, or you know, hard work, or good process, or you know, com coming from a good design um, thing? Yeah, that's my ill-formed question for you. I mean, the, 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 the cheat answer to that is it's always about the work, and you, the work needs to be perfect, and then luck is the, is the thing on top of that. But I don't think you believe that, and I know I don't believe that. Um, I mean, I'll tell you this. The last game I launched was Dots & Co, and we launched it two weeks after a thing. I, was it Pokemon Go? Was that that game? <laughs> yeah, so that just, that just changes the fundamental dynamics of the of the App Store charts in a way that you have no control over. Um, and that was very different from when we launched our previous game, where the App Store winds blew in our direction, not against us. And so that kind of thing, it, that, that's like a really identifiable, quantifiable kind of luck. Like that's not some weird, you know, touchy-feely, don't know. Um, Here's, I guess, m maybe my slightly more sophisticated cheat answer here, is we are really bad at clearly differentiating between luck and capital. Hmm. One of the reasons that nothing we did at Hide and Seek ever got off the ground was it was partly because we, we had too many things going on, and in some cases I'm sure it was partly because we were bad at our jobs. But we, we could never afford more than one roll of the dice. We put this thing out there, and if it didn't work, we weren't going to eat that month, so we had to run and do something else instead. Big companies get lucky because they can try over and over. And, if, and that doesn't even necessarily look like um, launching a thing that doesn't work and then launching a new thing and then launching a new thing. Two Dots has been alive for three years. Over the course of that three years, we've been able to make all kinds of additions and amends and, and alterations to it. We've been able to bring it out on extra platforms. We've been able to do all of these things. You know, that's a, that's a game that's been commercially successful all the way through. But if we hadn't been a studio with income, if we hadn't been a studio with investment, had we hit more bumps in the road, they would have killed us dead and we wouldn't have been able to do anything about it. So. I'm not saying luck still isn't a factor, but when you, when, you, when you look at a specific thing and think, well, those specific people got lucky, it's worth broadening your examination of the odds to say, well, how many rolls of the dice did they get? And how many rolls of the dice am I going to get? And how do, I, how do I sustain myself through those, those things? And then you just try and get smart about the other stuff. The, the, we, couldn't, you know, we couldn't quite have navigated around Pokemon Go, but we were navigating about, around a bunch of other stuff in the App Store that we did know about, that we had researched that we had kept our ears open for. You can certainly mitigate that kind of risk. Um, and similarly with, you know, with how you're handling market testing of visual assets, or you know, are you, you know you love them, but is anyone else gonna love them? You know, there's a, you can, you can um, amortize a bunch of that stuff, but never all of it. Slight, slightly less cheaty answer. Absolutely, I think that's a really great model for, for thinking about it. Thank you. Thank you. We're done. It's all over. Margarita time. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>